Can you go back to transparencies? One more. Uh, uh, can I just over there? What is rho as you go back towards the, the initial? Rho? Yeah. The standard energy density. In so it would be radiation like? Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, well, this has been worked for several. Uh, Several moves. I think that this, uh, the, the first one, the simplest one, was a scalar field. Ah, all right. So you put in, it's because you say it's followed by an inflationary phase, but you put in inflation by hand. It, there the are two different things. Um, it, with the scalar field, you get an accelerated expansion. At some point, there was some excitement in the field uh, that, all right, so you don't need to put uh, an inflation by hand. Uh, uh, I, I, this is not my field, but the people in the field uh, got uh, disappointed by this expectation and uh, got convinced that this is not sufficient to do the same job that inflation does usually. So nowadays, uh, the people in loop cosmology usually use this scheme plus an inflation potential, and so add inflation by hand to that. That's a standard. Uh, uh, deep in my heart, I always hope that uh, sort of... Uh, Quantum gravity would give the analog of the inflation, but I haven't seen it happening yet. So I don't understand the dynamic of your system. Can any quantized uh, bit of space-time uh, evolve by it independently of the rest, or are all your quantized uh, bits uh, connected to each other? A priori, they can evolve independently from one another, uh, there's nothing that forbids that uh, a priori. So the, 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 the Hilbert space contains uh, disconnected uh, graphs, if you want. Uh, whether this is relevant to the physics that we're doing, I, I don't know, and I don't want to stick my neck at all out of that. So I'm, I, I, I'm respectful, but not particularly enthusiastic about uh, 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 multi-universe multi in that sense. I think that what is interesting now is, is understanding what happened to two particles if I scatter them at the Planck scale. So I want to do quantum gravity here, simple, in this universe in a small region first, or try to understand uh, something about uh, uh, early universe before speculating about disconnected region space-time or even more. Yeah, because, because you eliminate the background, what we always have this tendency to think that your system is evolved within some kind of meta background. Or I would like not to think of any meta background. I mean, this is I, I would like to have in my theory the silver space of states, and uh, and so a transition is just a piece of space time, and uh, and. Uh, you know, it's, you can ask the same question in classical generativity. And I would try to give the same answer in classical generativity. Carlo, would you mind going forward one slide? I suppose that's... That, okay. that, that one. So it looks as if at long wavelengths, yeah. you're predicting an excess of yeah. power, whereas the data favors a deficit. Yeah. That's right. Isn't that... Uh, embarrassing. Em embarrassing. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it, it's early. I understand. It's early days. It's fine. Okay. Thank you. That's a hard prediction. Right. There's no, yeah. You can't modify. That's a hard prediction. No. Uh, David maybe can answer better than me. Uh, let me first. This is a PRL uh, just came out recently, and I present it more as a uh, as an evidence that there's work coming out on these things. Uh, uh, I don't know how what kind of input got into that, and I don't know. I mean, I. I I trust these authors, uh, but they have assumptions, a certain number of assumptions to get there, a certain number of simplifications. I would not say, I, I, I'm not ready to say uh, loop quantum gravity is going to fail if this, this measure thing goes down. Okay. Which is, I want to get to the point of that. Maybe David can say something about that. Actually, look at the plot here. So this is for a specific inflationary trajectory. So what you do is you work with a uh, m squared, phi squared potential, and this is for one evolution of the inflaton. If you'd put it in with different initial values, you'd end up with a different um, 
perturbations on top of the normal background here. So um, here I think it was absolutely minimal 67 E foldings, which is why you get an effect at very low K. But if you'd put the enfloton further up the potential, this effect would get suppressed to lower and lower K effectively. So the, 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 the answer is no, it's not a hard prediction. It's just a model working. So you can make the red line go downwards. You, okay. you could make it shift to the left. So in effect, oh, yes, it would. It would climb later. It yeah. Climb lower, case. lower and, I mean, and since K starts at two, there. I mean, it's not very. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, the modification to the Friedman equation seems very similar, almost identical to uh, two classes of models. One, the brain world models. Even in, in the Randall syndrome, which is the, the simplest of all, you get exactly that modification to the Friedman equation. With or else, yeah, or else it would be sigma, would be the tension of the brain. And there is also a whole class of uh, phenomenological models of big ribs and, and big crunches, where people just uh, make, make up that uh, modification by hand. So how would you be able to discriminate predictions of, of this particular model from all these other classes, whether they are derived or phenomenological. And, and the second question I have is you can absorb that modification, the, the thing in uh, uh, red brackets, you can absorb it in, into the Newton's constant. And, and instead of thinking of a modified Friedman equation, you can think of a modified Newton's constant. And, and there are very um, strong constraints on, you on that. You mean time-dependent Newton's constant? Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, you, you can make G as a function of rho over rho C. Yeah. And uh, in, in that case, you also have those extreme experimental constraints on Newton's constant. Good. I, I, let me answer, not in the manner Francesco would like to answer, I think. Um, let me answer as a theoretician. Okay, uh, because I think your question is very good, uh, and uh, it, I, I would like in, in the answer to get to the core of the thing. Um, from the point of view of somebody, uh, a, 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 a phenomenological cosmologist, of somebody doing observations, somebody doing data, the situation is that you have many possible models, analysis, and you want to try to discriminate that. Let me look at the situation from the other perspective, that of a uh, theoretician. I think that today uh, we have some uh, reliable knowledge of the world that might extrapolate or might not, but for the moment is reliable with generativity and quantum mechanics. Okay? Now you can do two things. Try to see what are the consequences of that, okay? or add whatever extra uh, pieces of uh, modeling you want. Okay? In my opinion, for me, it's what is interesting is the first thing much more than the second. This is a prediction that there might be something deeply wrong, subtle, it's possible. But this is a prediction that follows from the Einstein equations and standard Dirac quantum mechanics. Basically nothing else. Okay? Now, of course, I can say, well, let's imagine that g is a function of time. And uh, let's imagine that, of course, I can match any possible measurable thing by imagining something that is, follows that particular row. As a theoretician, I'm not particularly interested to that. I'm interested to say, what does it follow from what we know credibly today? Okay? QED was so fantastic because there was no hypothesis in QED. There was just special relativity, Maxwell equations, and Dirac quantum mechanics, nothing else. And give prediction to the 17th, to the 10th, 11th decimal. This is, the, this is the hope here. I understand that this answer is a little disappointing to you because you say, well, I don't, I, wait a moment, I want to discriminate for the... I don't think uh, the, the landscape of prediction is so strong now to be discriminating so clearly, so strongly, so, uh, so uniquely. Maybe it is, maybe, maybe Francesca, you can say more about that. But to me, what is interesting, what differentiates the two approaches is the theoretical side. There is no extra hypothesis here. There are, of course, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that the classical theory uniquely defined the quantum theory, but I'm saying that if, if you ask the problem, can you write a quantum theory which is consistent with quantum mechanics and which has classical generativity as, as a classical limit, then uh, this is a possible solution. I don't know almost any other solution today, and this is what comes out as a, as a prediction. So if it happened that this was confirmed, 
I would read this as, which is powerful, I would read it as a strong uh, support of this approach, even if there were other things that would look much more artificially to me to make things arbitrarily dependent of some extra parameter, some extra field, some extra dimension, some extra brain, some extra whatsoever that one can guess. That's my, my take. Maybe you want to say more? Oh, maybe somebody wants to say more. Yeah, um, you can't <laughs> just absorb the 1 minus rho over OC into G, you know, because you're then creating a, you know, a, a cosmological model with a time-dependent gravitational constant, and the Friedman equation is different. You know, it's got D dot over G and H terms. It looks like Brand's Dickey theory, not general relativity, so it's not quite so easy. And other people said the other theory you know, that looks like this, I think the minus sign is a plus sign. You know, so I also think that the minus sign is a plus sign. Yes. You know, you in Randall Sundra. Uh, I would say that it's a plus sign then, yeah. Yeah, so it's not, not a bad. Thank you, Carl.